Introduction. Chapter Objectives. After studying this chapter, you will be able to distinguish between anatomy and physiology and identify several branches of each. Describe the structure of the body, from simplest to most complex, in terms of the six levels of organization. Identify the functional characteristics of human life. Identify the four requirements for human survival. Define homeostasis and explain its importance to normal human functioning. Use appropriate anatomical terminology to identify key body structures, body regions, and directions in the body. Compare and contrast at least four medical imagining techniques in terms of their function and use in medicine, though you may approach a course in anatomy and physiology strictly as a requirement for your field of study. The knowledge you gain in this course will serve you well in many aspects of your life. An understanding of anatomy and physiology is not only fundamental to any career in the health professions, but it can also benefit your own health. Familiarity with the human body can help you make healthful choices and prompt you to take appropriate action when signs of illness arise. Your knowledge in this field will help you understand news about nutrition, medications, medical devices, and procedures and help you understand genetic or infectious diseases. At some point, Everyone will have a problem with some aspect of his or her body, and your knowledge can help you to be a better parent, spouse, partner, friend, colleague, or caregiver. This chapter begins with an overview of anatomy and physiology and a preview of the body regions and functions. It then covers the characteristics of life and how the body works to maintain stable conditions. It introduces a set of standard terms for body structures and for planes and positions in the body that will serve as a foundation for more comprehensive information covered later in the text. It ends with examples of medical imaging used to see inside the living body. 1.1 Overview of anatomy and physiology By the end of this section, you will be able to compare and contrast anatomy and physiology, including their specializations and methods of study. Discuss the fundamental relationship between anatomy and physiology. Human anatomy is the scientific study of the body's structures. Some of these structures are very small and can only be observed and analyzed with the assistance of a microscope. Other larger structures can readily be seen, manipulated, measured, and weighed. The word anatomy comes from a Greek root that means to cut apart. Human anatomy was first studied by observing the exterior of the body and observing the wounds of soldiers and other injuries. Later, physicians were allowed to dissect bodies of the dead to augment their knowledge. When a body is dissected, its structures are cut apart in order to observe their physical attributes and their relationships to one another. Dissection is still used in medical schools, anatomy courses, and in pathology labs. In order to observe structures in living people, However, a number of imaging techniques have been developed. These techniques allow clinicians to visualize structures inside the living body, such as a cancerous tumor or a fractured bone. Like most scientific disciplines, anatomy has areas of specialization. Gross anatomy is the study of the larger structures of the body, those visible without the aid of magnification. Figure 1.2 A. Macro means large, thus, Gross anatomy is also referred to as macroscopic anatomy. In contrast, micro means small, and microscopic anatomy is the study of structures that can be observed only with the use of a microscope or other magnification devices. Figure 1.2b. Microscopic anatomy includes cytology, the study of cells, and histology, the study of tissues. As the technology of microscopes has advanced, Anatomists have been able to observe smaller and smaller structures of the body, from slices of large structures like the heart, to the three dimensional structures of large molecules in the body. Figure 1.2 Gross and Microscopic Anatomy A. Gross anatomy considers large structures such as the brain. B. Microscopic anatomy can deal with the same structures, though at a different scale. This is a micrograph of nerve cells from the brain. LM times 1600. Credit R. Writer Hound, Wikimedia Commons. Credit B. Micrograph provided by the Regents of University of Michigan Medical School Copyright 2012. Anatomists take two general approaches to the study of the body's structures, regional and systemic. 
Regional anatomy is the study of the interrelationships of all of the structures in a specific body region, such as the abdomen. Studying regional 8. Anatomy helps us appreciate the interrelationships of body structures, such as how muscles, nerves, blood vessels, and other structures work together to serve a particular body region. In contrast, systemic anatomy is the study of the structures that make up a discrete body system. That is, a group of structures that work together to perform a unique body function. For example, a systemic anatomical study of the muscular system would consider all of the skeletal muscles of the body. Whereas anatomy is about structure, physiology is about function. Human physiology is the scientific study of the chemistry and physics of the structures of the body and the ways in which they work together to support the functions of life. Much of the study of physiology centers on the body's tendency toward homeostasis. Homeostasis is the state of steady internal conditions maintained by living things. The study of physiology certainly includes observation, both with the naked eye and with microscopes, as well as manipulations and measurements. However, current advances in physiology usually depend on carefully designed laboratory experiments that reveal the functions of the many structures and chemical compounds that make up the human body. Like anatomists, Physiologists typically specialize in a particular branch of physiology. For example, neurophysiology is the study of the brain, spinal cord, and nerves and how these work together to perform functions as complex and diverse as vision, movement, and thinking. Physiologists may work from the organ level, exploring, for example, what different parts of the brain do, to the molecular level, such as exploring how an electrochemical signal travels along nerves. Form is closely related to function in all living things. For example, the thin flap of your eyelid can snap down to clear away dust particles and almost instantaneously slide back up to allow you to see again. At the microscopic level, the arrangement and function of the nerves and muscles that serve the eyelid allow for its quick action and retreat. At a smaller level of analysis, the function of these nerves and muscles likewise relies on the interactions of specific molecules and ions. Even the three-dimensional structure of certain molecules is essential to their function. Your study of anatomy and physiology will make more sense if you continually relate the form of the structures you are studying to their function. In fact, it can be somewhat frustrating to attempt to study anatomy without an understanding of the physiology that a body structure supports. Imagine. For example, trying to appreciate the unique arrangement of the bones of the human hand if you had no conception of the function of the hand. Fortunately, your understanding of how the human hand manipulates tools, from pens to cell phones, helps you appreciate the unique alignment of the thumb in opposition to the four fingers, making your hand a structure that allows you to pinch and grasp objects and type text messages. 1.2 structural organization of the human body by the end of this section you will be able to describe the structure of the human body in terms of six levels of organization list the 11 organ systems of the human body and identify at least one organ and one major function of each before you begin to study the different structures and functions of the human body it is helpful to consider its basic architecture that is how its smallest parts are assembled into larger structures it is convenient to consider the structures of the body in terms of fundamental levels of organization that increase in complexity. Subatomic particles, atoms, molecules, organelles, cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, organisms and biosphere. Figure 1.3. Dot. 9 Figure 1.3 Levels of Structural Organization of the Human Body The organization of the body often is discussed in terms of six distinct levels of increasing complexity, from the smallest chemical building blocks to a unique human organism. The levels of organization to study the chemical level of organization, scientists consider the simplest building blocks of matter, subatomic particles, atoms and molecules. All matter in the universe is composed of one or more unique pure substances called elements, familiar examples of which are hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, calcium, and iron. The smallest unit of any of these pure substances, elements, is an atom. 
Atoms are made up of subatomic particles such as the proton, electron and neutron. Two or more atoms combine to form a molecule, such as the water molecules, proteins, and sugars found in living things. Molecules are the chemical building blocks of all body structures. A cell is the smallest independently functioning unit of a living organism. Even bacteria, which are extremely small, independently living organisms, have a cellular structure. Each bacterium is a single cell. All living structures of human 10. Anatomy contains cells, and almost all functions of human physiology are performed in cells or are initiated by cells. A human cell typically consists of flexible membranes that enclose cytoplasm, a water-based cellular fluid together with a variety of tiny functioning units called organelles. In humans, as in all organisms, cells perform all functions of life. A tissue is a group of many similar cells, though sometimes composed of a few related types, that work together to perform a specific function. An organ is an anatomically distinct structure of the body composed of two or more tissue types. Each organ performs one or more specific physiological functions. An organ system is a group of organs that work together to perform major functions or meet physiological needs of the body. This book covers 11 distinct organ systems in the human body, figure 1.4 and figure 1.5. Assigning organs to organ systems can be imprecise since organs that belong to one system can also have functions integral to another system. In fact, most organs contribute to more than one system. 11 figure 1.4 organ systems of the human body organs that work together are grouped into organ systems. 12. Figure 1.5 Organ systems of the human body. Continued, organs that work together are grouped into organ systems. Dot. 13 The organism level is the highest level of organization. An organism is a living being that has a cellular structure and that can independently perform all physiologic functions necessary for life. In multicellular organisms, including humans, all cells, tissues, organs, and organ systems of the body work together to maintain the life and health of the organism. 1.3. Functions of human life By the end of this section, you will be able to explain the importance of organization to the function of the human organism, distinguish between metabolism, anabolism, and catabolism, provide at least two examples of human responsiveness and human movement, Compare and contrast growth, differentiation, and reproduction The different organ systems each have different functions and therefore unique roles to perform in physiology. These many functions can be summarized in terms of a few that we might consider definitive of human life. Organization, metabolism, responsiveness, movement, development, and reproduction. Organization A human body consists of trillions of cells organized in a way that maintains distinct internal compartments. These compartments keep body cells separated from external environmental threats and keep the cells moist and nourished. They also separate internal body fluids from the countless microorganisms that grow on body surfaces, including the lining of certain tracts, or passageways. The intestinal tract, for example, is home to even more bacteria cells than the total of all human cells in the body. Yet these bacteria are outside the body and cannot be allowed to circulate freely inside the body. Cells, for example, have a cell membrane, also referred to as the plasma membrane, that keeps the intracellular environment, the fluids and organelles, separate from the extracellular environment. Blood vessels keep blood inside a closed circulatory system and nerves and muscles are wrapped in connective tissue sheaths that separate them from surrounding structures. In the chest and abdomen, a variety of internal membranes keep major organs such as the lungs, heart, and kidneys separate from others. The body's largest organ system is the integumentary system, which includes the skin and its associated structures, such as hair and nails. The surface tissue of skin is a barrier that protects internal structures and fluids from potentially harmful microorganisms and other toxins. Metabolism The first law of thermodynamics holds that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only change form. Your basic function as an organism is to consume, ingest, energy and molecules in the foods you eat. 
Convert some of it into fuel for movement, sustain your body functions, and build and maintain your body structures. There are two types of reactions that accomplish this anabolism and catabolism. Anabolism is the process whereby smaller, simpler molecules are combined into larger, more complex substances. Your body can assemble, by utilizing energy, the complex chemicals it needs by combining small molecules derived from the foods you eat. Catabolism is the process by which larger, more complex substances are broken down into smaller, simpler molecules. Catabolism releases energy. The complex molecules found in foods are broken down so the body can use their parts to assemble the structures and substances needed for life. Taken together, these two processes are called metabolism. Metabolism is the sum of all anabolic and catabolic reactions that take place in the body. Figure 1.6. Both anabolism and catabolism occur simultaneously and continuously to keep you alive. 14. Figure 1.6 Metabolism Anabolic reactions are building reactions, and they consume energy. Catabolic reactions break materials down and release energy. Metabolism includes both anabolic and catabolic reactions. Every cell in your body makes use of a chemical compound, adenosine triphosphate, ATP, to store and release energy. The cell stores energy in the synthesis, anabolism, of ATP then moves the ATP molecules to the location where energy is needed to fuel cellular activities. Then the ATP is broken down, catabolism, and a controlled amount of energy is released, which is used by the cell to perform a particular job. View this animation. HTTP colon slash slash openstackscollege.org slash L slash metabolic closing parenthesis to learn more about metabolic processes. What kind of catabolism occurs in the heart? Responsiveness Responsiveness is the ability of an organism to adjust to changes in its internal and external environments. An example of responsiveness to external stimuli could include moving toward sources of food and water and away from perceived dangers. Changes in an organism's internal environment, such as increased body temperature, can cause the responses of sweating and the dilation of blood vessels in the skin in order to decrease body temperature, as shown by the runners in figure 1.7. Movement Human movement includes not only actions at the joints of the body, but also the motion of individual organs and even individual cells. As you read these words, red and white blood cells are moving throughout your body. Muscle cells are contracting and relaxing to maintain your posture and to focus your vision and glands are secreting chemicals to regulate body functions. Your body is coordinating the action of entire muscle groups to enable you to move air into and out of your lungs, to push blood throughout your body, and to propel the food you have eaten through your digestive tract. Consciously. Chapter 1. An Introduction to the Human Body 15 Of course, you contract your skeletal muscles to move the bones of your skeleton to get from one place to another as the runners are doing in figure 1.7, and to carry out all of the activities of your daily life. Figure 1.7 Marathon Runners Runners demonstrate two characteristics of living humans, responsiveness and movement. Anatomic structures and physiological processes allow runners to coordinate the action of muscle groups and sweat in response to rising internal body temperature. Credit. Phil Roder, Flicker, Development, Growth and reproduction development is all of the changes the body goes through in life. Development includes the process of differentiation, in which unspecialized cells become specialized in structure and function to perform certain tasks in the body. Development also includes the processes of growth and repair, both of which involve cell differentiation. Growth is the increase in body size. Humans, like all multicellular organisms, grow by increasing the number of existing cells, increasing the amount of non-cellular material around cells, such as mineral deposits in bone, and, within very narrow limits, increasing the size of existing cells. Reproduction is the formation of a new organism from parent organisms. In humans, reproduction is carried out by the male and female reproductive systems. Because death will come to all complex organisms, without reproduction, the line of organisms would end. 1.4. Requirements for human life By the end of this section, you will be able to 
Discuss the role of oxygen and nutrients in maintaining human survival. Explain why extreme heat and extreme cold threaten human survival. Explain how the pressure exerted by gases and fluids influences human survival. Humans have been adapting to life on Earth for at least the past 200,000 years. Earth and its atmosphere have provided us with air to breathe, water to drink, and food to eat. But these are not the only requirements for survival. Although you may rarely think about it, you also cannot live outside of a certain range of temperature and pressure that the surface of our planet and its atmosphere provides. The next sections explore these four requirements of life. 16. Oxygen Atmospheric air is only about 20% oxygen, but that oxygen is a key component of the chemical reactions that keep the body alive, including the reactions that produce ATP. Brain cells are especially sensitive to lack of oxygen because of their requirement for a high and steady production of ATP. Brain damage is likely within 5 minutes without oxygen, and death is likely within 10 minutes. Nutrients A nutrient is a substance in foods and beverages that is essential to human survival. The three basic classes of nutrients are water, the energy-yielding and body-building nutrients, and the micronutrients, vitamins and minerals. The most critical nutrient is water. Depending on the environmental temperature and our state of health, we may be able to survive for only a few days without water. The body's functional chemicals are dissolved and transported in water, and the chemical reactions of life take place in water. Moreover, water is the largest component of cells, blood, and the fluid between cells, and water makes up about 70% of an adult's body mass. Water also helps regulate our internal temperature and cushions, protects, and lubricates joints and many other body structures. The energy-yielding nutrients are primarily carbohydrates and lipids, while proteins mainly supply the amino acids that are the building blocks of the body itself. You ingest these in plant and animal foods and beverages, and the digestive system breaks them down into molecules small enough to be absorbed. The breakdown products of carbohydrates and lipids can then be used in the metabolic processes that convert them to ATP. Although you might feel as if you are starving after missing a single meal, you can survive without consuming the energy-yielding nutrients for at least several weeks. Water and the energy-yielding nutrients are also referred to as macronutrients because the body needs them in large amounts. In contrast, micronutrients are vitamins and minerals. These elements and compounds participate in many essential chemical reactions and processes, such as nerve impulses, and some, such as calcium, also contribute to the body's structure. Your body can store some of the micronutrients in its tissues, and draw on those reserves if you fail to consume them in your diet for a few days or weeks. Some others' micronutrients, such as vitamin C and most of the B vitamins, are water-soluble and cannot be stored so you need to consume them every day or two. Narrow range of temperature You have probably seen news stories about athletes who died of heat stroke, or hikers who died of exposure to cold. Such deaths occur because the chemical reactions upon which the body depends can only take place within a narrow range of body temperature, from just below to just above 37 degrees Celsius, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. When body temperature rises well above or drops well below normal, certain proteins, enzymes, that facilitate chemical reactions lose their normal structure and their ability to function and the chemical reactions of metabolism cannot proceed. That said, the body can respond effectively to short-term exposure to heat, figure 1.8, or cold. One of the body's responses to heat is, of course, sweating. As sweat evaporates from skin, it removes some thermal energy from the body, cooling it. Adequate water, from the extracellular fluid in the body, is necessary to produce sweat, so adequate fluid intake is essential to balance that loss during the sweat response. Not surprisingly, the sweat response is much less effective in a humid environment because the air is already saturated with water. Thus, the sweat on the skin surface is not able to evaporate, an internal body temperature can get dangerously high. Chapter 1. An Introduction to the Human Body 17 Figure 1.8 Extreme Heat Humans Adapt to Some Degree to Repeated Exposure to High Temperatures. Credit. McKay Savage, Flickr. 
The body can also respond effectively to short term exposure to cold. One response to cold is shivering, which is random muscle movement that generates heat. Another response is increased breakdown of stored energy to generate heat. When that energy reserve is depleted, however, and the core temperature begins to drop significantly, red blood cells will lose their ability to give up oxygen, denying the brain of this critical component of ATP production. This lack of oxygen can cause confusion, lethargy, and eventually loss of consciousness and death. The body responds to cold by reducing blood circulation to the extremities, the hands and feet, in order to prevent blood from cooling there and so that the body's core can stay warm. Even when core body temperature remains stable, however, tissues exposed to severe cold, especially the fingers and toes, can develop frostbite when blood flow to the extremities has been much reduced. This form of tissue damage can be permanent and lead to gangrene, requiring amputation of the affected region. Controlled hypothermia as you have learned, the body continuously engages in coordinated physiological processes to maintain a stable temperature. In some cases, however, overriding this system can be useful, or even life-saving. Hypothermia is the clinical term for an abnormally low body temperature. Hypo equals below or under. Controlled hypothermia is clinically induced hypothermia performed in order to reduce the metabolic rate of an organ or of a person's entire body. Controlled hypothermia often is used, for example, during open heart surgery because it decreases the metabolic needs of the brain, heart, and other organs, reducing the risk of damage to them. When controlled hypothermia is used clinically, the patient is given medication to prevent shivering. The body is then cooled to 25 to 32 degrees Celsius, 79 to 89 degrees Fahrenheit. The heart is stopped and an external heart lung pump maintains circulation to the patient's body. The heart is cooled further and is maintained at a temperature below 15 degrees Celsius, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, for the duration of the surgery. This very cold temperature helps the heart muscle to tolerate its lack of blood supply during the surgery. Some emergency department physicians use controlled hypothermia to reduce damage to the heart in patients who have suffered a cardiac arrest. In the emergency department, the physician induces coma and lowers the patient's body temperature to approximately 91 degrees. This condition, which is maintained for 24 hours, slows the patient's metabolic rate. Because the patient's organs require less blood to function, the heart's workload is reduced. Narrow range of atmospheric pressure pressure is a force exerted by a substance that is in contact with another substance. Atmospheric pressure is pressure 18, exerted by the mixture of gases, primarily nitrogen and oxygen, in the Earth's atmosphere. Although you may not perceive it, atmospheric pressure is constantly pressing down on your body. This pressure keeps gases within your body, such as the gaseous nitrogen in body fluids, dissolved. If you were suddenly ejected from a spaceship above Earth's atmosphere, you would go from a situation of normal pressure to one of very low pressure. The pressure of the nitrogen gas in your blood would be much higher than the pressure of nitrogen in the space surrounding your body. As a result, the nitrogen gas in your blood would expand forming bubbles that could block blood vessels and even cause cells to break apart. Atmospheric pressure does more than just keep blood gases dissolved. Your ability to breathe, that is, to take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide, also depends upon a precise atmospheric pressure. Altitude sickness occurs in part because the atmosphere at high altitudes exerts less pressure, reducing the exchange of these gases, and causing shortness of breath, confusion, headache, lethargy, and nausea. Mountain climbers carry oxygen to reduce the effects of both low oxygen levels and low barometric pressure at higher altitudes. Figure 1.9. Figure 1.9 Harsh conditions climbers on Mount Everest must accommodate extreme cold, low oxygen levels, and low barometric pressure in an environment hostile to human life. Credit. Melanie Co. Flicker. Chapter 1. An Introduction to the Human Body 19 Decompression Sickness Decompression Sickness, DCS, is a condition in which gases dissolved in the blood or in other body tissues are no longer dissolved following a reduction in pressure on the body. 
This condition affects underwater divers who surface from a deep dive too quickly, and it can affect pilots flying at high altitudes in planes with unpressurized cabins. Divers often call this condition the bends, a reference to joint pain that is a symptom of DCS. In all cases, DCS is brought about by a reduction in barometric pressure. At high altitude, barometric pressure is much less than on Earth's surface because pressure is produced by the weight of the column of air above the body pressing down on the body. The very great pressures on divers in deep water are likewise from the weight of a column of water pressing down on the body. For divers, DCS occurs at normal barometric pressure, at sea level, but it is brought on by the relatively rapid decrease of pressure as divers rise from the high pressure conditions of deep water to the now low, by comparison, pressure at sea level. Not surprisingly, diving in deep mountain lakes, where barometric pressure at the surface of the lake is less than that at sea level is more likely to result in DCS than diving in water at sea level. In DCS, gases dissolved in the blood, primarily nitrogen, come rapidly out of solution, forming bubbles in the blood and in other body tissues. This occurs because when pressure of a gas over a liquid is decreased, the amount of gas that can remain dissolved in the liquid also is decreased. It is air pressure that keeps your normal blood gases dissolved in the blood. When pressure is reduced, less gas remains dissolved. You have seen this in effect when you open a carbonated drink. Removing the seal of the bottle reduces the pressure of the gas over the liquid. This in turn causes bubbles as dissolved gases, in this case, carbon dioxide, come out of solution in the liquid. The most common symptoms of DCS are pain in the joints with headache and disturbances of vision occurring in 10% to 15% of cases. Left untreated, very severe DCS can result in death. Immediate treatment is with pure oxygen. The affected person is then moved into a hyperbaric chamber. A hyperbaric chamber is a reinforced, closed chamber that is pressurized to greater than atmospheric pressure. It treats DCS by repressurizing the body so that pressure can then be removed much more gradually. Because the hyperbaric chamber introduces oxygen to the body at high pressure, it increases the concentration of oxygen in the blood. This has the effect of replacing some of the nitrogen in the blood with oxygen, which is easier to tolerate out of solution. The dynamic pressure of body fluids is also important to human survival. For example, Blood pressure, which is the pressure exerted by blood as it flows within blood vessels, must be great enough to enable blood to reach all body tissues, and yet low enough to ensure that the delicate blood vessels can withstand the friction and force of the pulsating flow of pressurized blood. 1.5. Homeostasis By the end of this section, you will be able to discuss the role of homeostasis in healthy functioning, contrast negative and positive feedback, Giving one physiologic example of each mechanism maintaining homeostasis requires that the body continuously monitor its internal conditions. From body temperature to blood pressure to levels of certain nutrients, each physiological condition has a particular set point. A set point is the physiological value around which the normal range fluctuates. A normal range is the restricted set of values that is optimally healthful and stable. For example, the set point for normal human body temperature is approximately 37 degrees Celsius, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Physiological parameters, such as body temperature and blood pressure, tend to fluctuate within a normal range a few degrees above and below that point. Control centers in the brain and other parts of the body monitor and react to deviations from homeostasis using negative feedback. Negative feedback is a mechanism that reverses a deviation from the set point. Therefore, negative feedback maintains body parameters within their normal range. The maintenance of homeostasis by negative feedback goes on throughout the body at all times, and an understanding of negative feedback is thus fundamental to an understanding of human physiology. 20. Negative feedback A negative feedback system has three basic components. Figure 1.10 a sensor, also referred to a receptor, is a component of a feedback system that monitors a physiological value. This value is reported to the control center. 
The control center is the component in a feedback system that compares the value to the normal range. If the value deviates too much from the set point, then the control center activates an effector. An effector is the component in a feedback system that causes a change to reverse the situation and return the value to the normal range. Figure 1.10 Negative feedback loop in a negative feedback loop, a stimulus, a deviation from a set point, is resisted through a physiological process that returns the body to homeostasis. A. A negative feedback loop has four basic parts. B. Body temperature is regulated by negative feedback. In order to set the system in motion, a stimulus must drive a physiological parameter beyond its normal range, that is, beyond homeostasis. This stimulus is heard by a specific sensor. For example, in the control of blood glucose, specific endocrine cells in the pancreas detect excess glucose, the stimulus, in the bloodstream. These pancreatic beta cells respond to the increased level of blood glucose by releasing the hormone insulin into the bloodstream. The insulin signals skeletal muscle fibers, fat cells, adipocytes, and liver cells to take up the excess glucose, removing it from the bloodstream. As glucose concentration in the bloodstream drops, the decrease in concentration, the actual negative feedback, is detected by pancreatic alpha cells, and insulin release stops. This prevents blood sugar levels from continuing to drop below the normal range. Humans have a similar temperature regulation feedback system that works by promoting either heat loss or heat gain. Figure 1.10b. When the brain's temperature regulation center receives data from the sensors indicating that the body's temperature exceeds its normal range, it stimulates a cluster of brain cells referred to as the heat loss center. This stimulation has three major effects. Blood vessels in the skin begin to dilate allowing more blood from the body core to flow to the surface of the skin allowing the heat to radiate into the environment. As blood flow to the skin increases, sweat glands are activated to increase their output. As the sweat evaporates from the skin surface into the surrounding air, it takes heat with it. The depth of respiration increases, and a person may breathe through an open mouth instead of through the nasal passageways. This further increases heat loss from the lungs. In contrast, activation of the brain's heat gain center by exposure to cold reduces blood flow to the skin and blood returning from the limbs is diverted into a network of deep veins. This arrangement traps heat closer to the body core and restricts heat loss. If heat loss is severe, the brain triggers an increase in random signals to skeletal muscles, causing them to contract and producing shivering. The muscle contractions of shivering release heat while using up ATP. The brain triggers the thyroid gland in the endocrine system to release thyroid hormone which increases metabolic activity and heat production in cells. Baby is born. At this point, the stretching of the cervix halts, stopping the release of oxytocin. A second example of positive feedback centers on reversing extreme damage to the body. Following a penetrating wound, the most immediate threat is excessive blood loss. Less blood circulating means reduced blood pressure and reduced perfusion, penetration of blood, to the brain and other vital organs. If perfusion is severely reduced, vital organs will shut down and the person will die. The body responds to this potential catastrophe by releasing substances in the injured blood vessel wall that begin the process of blood clotting. As each step of clotting occurs, it stimulates the release of more clotting substances. This accelerates the processes of clotting and sealing off the damaged area. Clotting is contained in a local area based on the tightly controlled availability of clotting proteins. This is an adaptive, life-saving cascade of events. 1.6. Anatomical terminology By the end of this section, you will be able to demonstrate the anatomical position, describe the human body using directional and regional terms, identify three planes most commonly used in the study of anatomy, distinguish between the posterior, dorsal, and the anterior, ventral, body cavities, identifying their subdivisions and representative organs found in each, describe serous membrane and explain its function anatomists and healthcare providers use terminology that can be bewildering to the uninitiated. However, 
The purpose of this language is not to confuse, but rather to increase precision and reduce medical errors. For example, is a scar above the wrist, located on the forearm two or three inches away from the hand? Or is it at the base of the hand? Is it on the palm side or back side? By using precise anatomical terminology, we eliminate ambiguity. Anatomical terms derive from ancient Greek and Latin words. Because these languages are no longer used in everyday conversation, the meaning of their words does not change. Anatomical terms are made up of roots, prefixes, and suffixes. The root of a term often refers to an organ, tissue, or condition, whereas the prefix or suffix often describes the root. For example, in the disorder hypertension, the prefix hyper means high or over, and the root word tension refers to pressure. So the word hypertension refers to abnormally high blood pressure. Anatomical position to further increase precision, anatomists teens standardize the way in which they view the body. Just as maps are normally oriented with north at the top, the standard body map or anatomical position is that of the body standing upright, with the feet at shoulder width and parallel, toes forward. The upper limbs are held out to each side, and the palms of the hands face forward as illustrated in figure 1.12. Using this standard position reduces confusion. It does not matter how the body being described is oriented. The terms are used as if it is an anatomical position. For example, a scar in the anterior, front, carpal, wrist, region, would be present on the palm side of the wrist. The term, anterior, would be used even if the hand were palm down on a table. Chapter 1. An Introduction to the Human Body 23 Figure 1.12 Regions of the Human Body The human body is shown in anatomical position in an a anterior view and a b posterior view. The regions of the body are labeled in boldface. A body that is lying down is described as either prone or supine. Prone describes a face-down orientation, and supine describes a face-up orientation. These terms are sometimes used in describing the position of the body during specific physical examinations or surgical procedures. Regional terms The human body's numerous regions have specific terms to help increase precision. See Figure 1.12. Notice that the term, brachium, or, arm, is reserved for the, upper arm, and, antebrachium, or, forearm, is used rather than, lower arm. Similarly, femur, or, thigh, is correct, and, leg, or, cruise, is reserved for the portion of the lower limb between the knee and the ankle. You will be able to describe the body's regions using the terms from the figure. Directional terms Certain directional anatomical terms appear throughout this and any other anatomy textbook. Figure 1.13. These terms are essential for describing the relative locations of different body structures. For instance, an anatomist might describe one band of tissue as inferior to another or a physician might describe a tumor as superficial to a deeper body structure. Commit these terms to memory to avoid confusion when you are studying or describing the locations of particular body parts. Anterior, or ventral, describes the front or direction toward the front of the body. The toes are anterior to the foot. Posterior, or dorsal, describes the back or direction toward the back of the body. The poplitis is posterior to the patella. Superior, or cranial describes a position above or higher than another part of the body proper. The orbits are superior 24. To the orus, inferior, or caudal, describes a position below or lower than another part of the body proper, near or toward the tail, in humans, the coccyx, or lowest part of the spinal column. The pelvis is inferior to the abdomen. Lateral describes the side or direction toward the side of the body. The thumb, pollux, is lateral to the digits. Medial describes the middle or direction toward the middle of the body. The hallux is the medial toe. Proximal describes a position in a limb that is nearer to the point of attachment or the trunk of the body. The brachium is proximal to the antebrachium. Distal describes a position in a limb that is farther from the point of attachment or the trunk of the body. The cruise is distal to the femur. Superficial describes a position closer to the surface of the body. 
The skin is superficial to the bones. Deep describes a position farther from the surface of the body. The brain is deep to the skull. Figure 1.13 Directional terms applied to the human body Paired directional terms are shown as applied to the human body. Body planes A section is a two-dimensional surface of a three-dimensional structure that has been cut. Modern medical imaging devices enable clinicians to obtain virtual sections of living bodies. We call these scans. Body sections and scans can be correctly interpreted. However, only if the viewer understands the plane along which the section was made. A plane is an imaginary two-dimensional surface that passes through the body. There are three planes commonly referred to in anatomy and medicine, as illustrated in figure 1.14. The sagittal plane is the plane that divides the body or an organ vertically into right and left sides. If this vertical plane runs directly down the middle of the body, it is called the midsagittal or median plane. If it divides the body into chapter 1, an introduction to the human body 25 unequal right and left sides, it is called a parasagittal plane or less commonly a longitudinal section. The frontal plane is the plane that divides the body or an organ into an anterior, front, portion and a posterior, rear, portion. The frontal plane is often referred to as a coronal plane. Corona, is Latin for, crown. The transverse plane is the plane that divides the body or organ horizontally into upper and lower portions. Transverse planes produce images referred to as cross sections. Figure 1.14 Planes of the body The three planes most commonly used in anatomical and medical imaging are the sagittal, frontal, or coronal, and transverse plane. Body cavities and serous membranes The body maintains its internal organization by means of membranes, sheaths, and other structures that separate compartments. The dorsal, posterior, cavity and the ventral, anterior, cavity are the largest body compartments. Figure 1.15. These cavities contain and protect delicate internal organs, and the ventral cavity allows for significant changes in the size and shape of the organs as they perform their functions. The lungs, heart, stomach, and intestines, for example, can expand and contract without distorting other tissues or disrupting the activity of nearby organs. 26. Figure 1.15 Dorsal and ventral body cavities The ventral cavity includes the thoracic and abdominopelvic cavities and their subdivisions. The dorsal cavity includes the cranial and spinal cavities. Subdivisions of the posterior, dorsal, and anterior. Ventral, cavities The posterior, dorsal, and anterior. Ventral, cavities are each subdivided into smaller cavities. In the posterior, dorsal, cavity, the cranial cavity houses the brain, and the spinal cavity, or vertebral cavity, encloses the spinal cord. Just as the brain and spinal cord make up a continuous, uninterrupted structure, the cranial and spinal cavities that house them are also continuous. The brain and spinal cord are protected by the bones of the skull and vertebral column and by cerebrospinal fluid, a colorless fluid produced by the brain, which cushions the brain and spinal cord within the posterior, dorsal, cavity. The anterior, ventral, cavity has two main subdivisions, the thoracic cavity and the abdominopelvic cavity. See figure 1.15. The thoracic cavity is the more superior subdivision of the anterior cavity, and it is enclosed by the rib cage. The thoracic cavity contains the lungs and the heart, which is located in the mediastinum. The diaphragm forms the floor of the thoracic cavity and separates it from the more inferior abdominopelvic cavity. The abdominopelvic cavity is the largest cavity in the body. Although no membrane physically divides the abdominopelvic cavity, it can be useful to distinguish between the abdominal cavity, the division that houses the digestive organs, and the pelvic cavity, the division that houses the organs of reproduction. Abdominal regions. Quadrants to promote clear communication. For instance about the location of a patient's abdominal pain or a suspicious mass, healthcare providers typically divide up the cavity into either nine regions or four quadrants. Figure 1.16. Chapter 1. An introduction to the human body 27 figure 1.16 regions and quadrants of the peritoneal cavity there are 
a, nine abdominal regions and b, four abdominal quadrants in the peritoneal cavity. The more detailed regional approach subdivides the cavity with one horizontal line immediately inferior to the ribs and one immediately superior to the pelvis, and two vertical lines drawn as if dropped from the midpoint of each clavicle, collarbone. There are nine resulting regions. The simpler quadrants approach, which is more commonly used in medicine, subdivides the cavity with one horizontal and one vertical line that intersect at the patient's umbilicus, navel. Membranes of the anterior, ventral, body cavity a serous membrane, also referred to a serosa, is one of the thin membranes that cover the walls and organs in the thoracic and abdominopelvic cavities. The parietal layers of the membranes line the walls of the body cavity. Periot refers to a cavity wall. The visceral layer of the membrane covers the organs, the viscera. Between the parietal and visceral layers is a very thin, fluid-filled serous space, or cavity. Figure 1.17. Figure 1.17 Serous membrane Serous membrane lines the pericardial cavity and reflects back to cover the heart. Much the same way that an underinflated balloon would form two layers surrounding a fist. There are three serous cavities and their associated membranes. The pleura is the serous membrane that surrounds the lungs in the pleural cavity. The pericardium is the serous membrane that surrounds the heart in the pericardial cavity. And the peritoneum is the serous membrane that surrounds several organs in the abdominopelvic cavity. The serous membranes form fluid filled sacs, or cavities that are meant to cushion and reduce friction on internal organs when they move, such as when the lungs inflate or the heart beats. Both the parietal and visceral serosa secrete the thin, slippery serous fluid located within the serous cavities. The pleural cavity reduces friction between the lungs and the body wall. Likewise, the pericardial cavity reduces friction between the heart and the wall of the pericardium. The peritoneal cavity reduces friction between the 28 abdominal and pelvic organs and the body wall. Therefore, serous membranes provide additional protection to the viscera they enclose by reducing friction that could lead to inflammation of the organs. 1.7. Medical imaging By the end of this section, you will be able to discuss the uses and drawbacks of X-ray imaging. Identify four modern medical imaging techniques and how they are used for thousands of years. Fear of the dead and legal sanctions limited the ability of anatomists and physicians to study the internal structures of the human body. An inability to control bleeding, infection, and pain made surgeries infrequent, and those that were performed, such as wound suturing, amputations, tooth and tumor removals, skull drilling, and cesarean births did not greatly advance knowledge about internal anatomy. Theories about the function of the body and about disease were therefore largely based on external observations and imagination. During the 14th and 15th centuries, however, the detailed anatomical drawings of Italian artist and anatomist Leonardo da Vinci and Flemish anatomist Andreas Vesalius were published, and interest in human anatomy began to increase. Medical schools began to teach anatomy using human dissection, although some resorted to grave robbing to obtain corpses. Laws were eventually passed that enabled students to dissect the corpses of criminals and those who donated their bodies for research. Still, it was not until the late 19th century that medical researchers discovered non-surgical methods to look inside the living body. X-rays German physicist Wilhelm Röntgen 1845-1923, was experimenting with electrical current when he discovered that a mysterious and invisible ray would pass through his flesh but leave an outline of his bones on a screen coated with a metal compound. In 1895, Röntgen made the first durable record of the internal parts of a living human, an X-ray image, as it came to be called, of his wife's hand. Scientists around the world quickly began their own experiments with X-rays, and by 1900, X-rays were widely used to detect a variety of injuries and diseases. In 1901, Röntgen was awarded the first Nobel Prize for Physics for his work in this field. The X-ray is a form of high-energy electromagnetic radiation with a short wavelength capable of penetrating solids and ionizing gases. As they are used in medicine, X-rays are emitted from an X-ray machine and directed toward a specially treated 
metallic plate placed behind the patient's body. The beam of radiation results in darkening of the X-ray plate. X-rays are slightly impeded by soft tissues, which show up as gray on the X-ray plate, whereas hard tissues, such as bone, largely block the rays, producing a light-toned shadow. Thus, X-rays are best used to visualize hard body structures such as teeth and bones. Figure 1.18. Like many forms of high-energy radiation, however, X-rays are capable of damaging cells and initiating changes that can lead to cancer. This danger of excessive exposure to X-rays was not fully appreciated for many years after their widespread use. Chapter 1. An Introduction to the Human Body 29 Figure 1.18 X-ray of a hand High-energy electromagnetic radiation allows the internal structures of the body, such as bones, to be seen in X-rays like these. Credit. Trace Meek, Flicker. Refinements and enhancements of X-ray techniques have continued throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. Although often supplanted by more sophisticated imaging techniques, the X-ray remains a workhorse in medical imaging, especially for viewing fractures and for dentistry. The disadvantage of irradiation to the patient and the operator is now attenuated by proper shielding and by limiting exposure. Modern medical imaging X-rays can depict a two-dimensional image of a body region, and only from a single angle. In contrast, more recent medical imaging technologies produce data that is integrated and analyzed by computers to produce three-dimensional images or images that reveal aspects of body functioning. Computed tomography Tomography refers to imaging by sections. Computed tomography CT, is a non-invasive imaging technique that uses computers to analyze several cross-sectional X-rays in order to reveal minute details about structures in the body. Figure 1.19 of the technique was invented in the 1970s and is based on the principle that, as X-rays pass through the body, they are absorbed or reflected at different levels. In the technique, a patient lies on a motorized platform while a computerized axial tomography CAT, scanner rotates 360 degrees around the patient, taking X-ray images. A computer combines these images into a two-dimensional view of the scanned area, or, slice. 30. Figure 1.19 Medical Imaging Techniques, A. Uh. The results of a CT scan of the head are shown as successive transverse sections. B. An MRI machine generates a magnetic field around a patient. C. PET scans use radiopharmaceuticals to create images of active blood flow and physiologic activity of the organ or organs being targeted. D. Ultrasound technology is used to monitor pregnancies because it is the least invasive of imaging techniques and uses no electromagnetic radiation. Credit A. Akira Ogaki, Flickr. Credit B. Digital Kate, Flickr. Credit C. Raziel, Wikimedia Commons. Credit D. Isis, Wikimedia Commons. Since 1970, the development of more powerful computers and more sophisticated software has made CT scanning routine for many types of diagnostic evaluations. It is especially useful for soft tissue scanning, such as of the brain and the thoracic and abdominal viscera. Its level of detail is so precise that it can allow physicians to measure the size of a mass down to a millimeter. The main disadvantage of CT scanning is that it exposes patients to a dose of radiation many times higher than that of X-rays. In fact, children who undergo CT scans are at increased risk of developing cancer, as are adults who have multiple CT scans. Chapter 1. An introduction to the human body 31 ACT or CAT scan relies on a circling scanner that revolves around the patient's body. Watch this video http colon slash slash openstackscollege.org slash l slash cat scan closing parenthesis to learn more about ct and cat scans what type of radiation does a ct scanner use magnetic resonance imaging magnetic resonance imaging mri is a non-invasive medical imaging technique based on a phenomenon of nuclear physics discovered in the 1930s in which matter exposed to magnetic fields and radio waves was found to emit radio signals. In 1970, a physician and researcher named Raymond Damadian noticed that malignant, cancerous, tissue gave off different signals than normal body tissue. 
He applied for a patent for the first MRI scanning device, which was in use clinically by the early 1980s. The early MRI scanners were crude, but advances in digital computing and electronics led to their advancement over any other technique for precise imaging, especially to discover tumors. MRI also has the major advantage of not exposing patients to radiation. Drawbacks of MRI scans include their much higher cost and patient discomfort with the procedure. The MRI scanner subjects the patient to such powerful electromagnets that the scan room must be shielded. The patient must be enclosed in a metal tube like device for the duration of the scan. See Figure 1.19b. Sometimes as long as 30 minutes which can be uncomfortable.